everyone, and welcome to Capes, Cows, and Masks, the show where we uncover the world of soups and science fiction. I'm your host, Jake Hart. I'm a podcaster and a writer for Fresh Take Hub, and as always, I'm joined by my fellow co-host. Hi there, everyone. Tom Gapper, comic book shogun, all-around good guy, and uh, very excited for today's show. It's a topic that I am very thrilled to be talking about, actually. Um, so I, I, th- I think both of you two as, as well. So uh, let's just crack on with it, I think. Absolutely. I can't wait to be doing this uh, deep dive episode, you know, where we you know, pick a topic and dive deep into what it means for us and our guests. And, you know, we thought with the upcoming release of The Suicide Squad and the recent trend within Hollywood, not just, you know, superhero films, but other movie studios making solo villain films, we thought it'd be fun to discuss supervillains, what we think of them what makes a good supervillain, some of our favorites, and a lot more of other stuff. And as I said up top, we do have a guest joining us today. He's been on the show before, so welcome back to the show, filmmaker, writer, and Batman nut. You want to get nuts, Rob? <laughs> it's Rob Ailey. <laughs> Lovely introduction, as always. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for having me on once again. And uh, I hope you don't mind, because uh, they obviously we uh, are doing audio here, but I did wear my Joker suit today for in honor of this... Uh, uh, episode i thought uh it'd be quite fitting to to get into character so to say for this one so uh i'm excited okay which one of us is going to get what they deserve <laughs> don't get too into character now well, i'm gonna hear a knock on my door <laughs> oh, god god he's got a pair of scissors hiding behind me <laughs> oh, he's ready oh my god <laughs> oh dear. this got dark this got dark very quickly <laughs> very very fitting quickly. very fitting Yes, very fitting indeed. So, supervillains. Now, we all love supervillains. You know, sometimes we even think the supervillains are more interesting than the superheroes, and that's what gravitates us towards the story that's being presented towards us. But at the same time, these are horrible people with horrible intentions, doing horrible things and causing death and destruction. So you have to ask the question, why do we like these horrible people? What is it about them that makes them tick? that us humans gravitate towards him. So, Rob, I'll start with you. When you think of supervillains, what do you think of? Like, what's your emotional reaction when you think of supervillains? And is there a particular one that comes to mind when you you think of the concept of supervillains? It's good to be bad, isn't it? Uh, That's the old phrase that comes about each time, isn't it? So for me... As a filmmaker, as a storyteller, like it's always exciting to write a bad guy or a um, super villain in this case. And the the, the beauty of it is, is that as stories have progressed and as uh, films have progressed and as comics and, you know, the medium has transformed, we're now dissecting into the super villain iconography even further and actually realizing that they've got further deeper methods and um, story to them and how they are and their origins. And I am going to go for a very obvious choice because, you know, you never forget the scariest character you see as a kid and it has to be the Joker. Like I remember seeing Jack Nicholson on screen. It was the first time I ever witnessed Jack Nicholson first and foremost. So you know, what a marvellous way to be introduced to that actor, first of all, but also to be introduced to the Joker, a character that thrives on hurting people and also plays jokes on people and, you know, poisons cosmetics. You know, like now I've got to use beard oil for my beard. So I even even to this day think, oh, my God, what could, you know, what would happen if I had bought something? You know, it. These are it's almost like that whole thing in The Simpsons where he's like, every time I check my toilet for a bomb now, like it's it's that kind of thing, you know. And as a kid, obviously I wasn't thinking about beard or anything, but I was thinking more about, you know, what if I met a character or a clown like the Joker? And that's why, and I don't think I've told this to many people, I'm actually petrified of clowns. So there is so it's kind of weird that I'm dressed as this character right now in well and in suit form, but I'm absolutely petrified of clowns. Even as a kid, like when they said, oh, do you want a a clown for your birthday? No, I don't want a clown for my birthday. (laughs) They see what they look like. You see what they can do. And every time they would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You always say it all the time. It's what the Joker, you know, it's the Joker this, the Joker that. But when a character like that can imprint in your mind like that and with that kind of grin as well, oh, that's, 
you know, a key supervillain for me. You know, one of the, the worst and one of the best. That's a, a pretty great answer. A pretty good answer there. So, Tom, what about you? What is What do you think of when you think of the concept of supervillains and who do you think of? It's it's something I've been grappling with since you told me we were going to be doing this podcast. Like, what exactly is it that really pulls us towards these supervillains? I mean, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think it's just you get a certain joy out of... I think Rob actually said it best with It's Good to Be Bad. You get a certain joy out of just, like, the Joker's a prime example. I knew you were going to bring him up this as well. <laughs> but he is a prime example of the fact that, like, you know he's evil, you know what he's doing is wrong, and you know as well that put in a situation if you like had to choose to stand against him or with him, you know you're going to choose to like go against him. But he's just so damn fun to watch, and you find yourself laughing at his jokes. And it's just, I think also it's just the more like threatening, the more powerful the villain is, the more he like draws you in. I, I think it's because like you know that the superhero is eventually going to win. So you know they're going to have to pull off something to like over like something amazing to overcome this villain. So you draw yourself into these villains because it just makes that moment when the superhero wins just all that more sweeter if anything because you've like drawn yourself in going like maybe I actually like agree with his views, maybe I'm actually like thinking yeah, no the hero's in the wrong on this one. Maybe I'd actually like to see him win, but then the hero gets the chance to do something and give a speech where you're like oh that actually just recontextualizes everything and makes it it's the classic yin and yang we love super villains because we love superheroes and they bounce and play off each other especially in comics so perfectly and that's why like when i think of super villains i think of sinestra i mean my pit my, my name currently on zencaster dear listeners is, is sinestro simp he is a perfect example of that yin yang thing with superheroes in that him and Hal Jordan, first they were friends. He like Sinestra was a mentor to Hal, taught him how to be a lantern, trusted him enough to bring him back to his home planet, even though Sinestro knew what he was doing was against like Guardian policy. So when Hal Jordan sees that this guy he's looked up to as the guy who's been touted as the greatest lantern is actually just a dictator. It's like that emotional gut punch. And then just throughout their relationship, there is always that aspect of they used to be friends, but Sinestro is just, he just has a completely different view of the universe. And like that just spans out throughout the decades. And it's always been a constant source of rich, rich material leading up to like Sinestro Core Wars, where like that really got to its peak and Sinestro finally like gained power over the power of fear, truly. So yeah, it is just. With supervillains, sometimes it's just because, like the Joker, they are just so damn fun to like watch. And sometimes it's like with villains with Sinestro, where you just you love it because like he's such an incredible villain, but you can't help but think in the back of your head what he could have been. And so there's always that aspect of it. And so I think that's my answer for that question. That's a great answer as well. I think for myself, like I'm. You know, because I think there's a difference between villains and supervillains. And I'm often more fascinated by the supervillains. Like, and I often think of them sort of more like um, as geniuses. Because you can have like villains and antagonists that are a little more like brute force or assassins who have been hired by a higher power to take out the good guys. But when I think of supervillains, I think they are often geniuses. And they have a master plan that comes from some sort of perspective. And they love to rant about it. <laughs> Very often using big words. <laughs> There's a lot of anguish screaming from them a lot of the time as well. A lot of monologuing. <laughs> and I often think there's a perspective where the supervillains feel unappreciated. Like, even if their goal or motivation in the actual story is a pretty straightforward, like, I deserve more power. Like, almost always when you dig down, they feel wronged or pushed out of society or there was something that's been there that, that, that they think they should have had but was taken from them by society or by something. And I think if you add all those elements together, you combine it together, this is what makes them such compelling characters. They just have a little bit more depth to them than the the average hero we see on screen and like 
my when I think of supervillains, it's a bit of a left field, but I think he's almost like the master supervillain in a, in a sense. And like you said, Rob, it's like your first fear in a way. And it's not comic book related, but I do have to go to Emperor Palpatine, okay? Because he is the master of evil, isn't he? There's just no redemption in that guy whatsoever. And I remember as a kid watching Return of the Jedi, and yeah, everybody's like, yeah, Vader's badass and stuff like that. But then when you get to Return of the Jedi, here's this creepy old dude who, you know, he looks weak and frail, but you just feel this evil oozing off him. Just the way he speaks like this. He hates speaking. It's like he hates saying words. You know what I mean? Like, and, like he, and the fact that he has this hold over Vader, who we've been, you know, up to this point, being led to that, this is the bad guy. You know what I mean? Don't fuck with Vader sort of thing. For then this shriveled old guy to come and be, I am the emperor, you know? And it's just absolutely haunting. And then for me, when I was a bit older and then seeing the prequels and then how he is in Revenge of the Sith, I was just like, God, this guy is just evil incarnate. Do you know what I mean? And it scares me. And in a way, I'll talk about Palpatine a bit later, but he also represents, in a sense, a real life um, evil that you know that we deal with in our in our lives in society today. So, but more on that later. Rob, when, when like, what is it that you specifically are drawn to supervillains for? Like, why do you find them intriguing? And are you willing to put pictures of these horrible people up in your home? <laughs> I feel like I kind of do. <laughs> I can literally see the Joker behind him, Jake. You can see the Joker. Like, right there. These, you know, it's like putting up a picture of, like, serial killers. You're like, we, you don't do that. But because they're fictional, it's like, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, I said it just at the very beginning. I'm petrified of clowns and I'm petrified of the Joker sometimes. But, yeah, I have that right above my bed in my, well, office slash bedroom. So, yeah. Um, you know, what does that say? So, Rob, is, is that your way of saying to conquer fear? You must become fear. You must become fear. Exactly. <laughs> Oh. It's like, yes, father, I shall become the clown. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny enough, it's what you don't see is what I'm intrigued by or what we don't hear about them. That's what really intrigues me about them the most. And that's what I love about the supervillains in particular. And I mentioned with Joker, like he is an unreliable narrator because each time he changes his origin, you know, say in The Dark Knight, you know, do you know how I got these scars? And he changes the story each time. In Joker, Yet we, it's called, you know, it's it's an origin story, but actually we ultimately find out, spoiler alert, that he's not really Arthur Fleck. And that's the genius of that movie as well, is that by the end of it all, we're still left with unanswered questions. And that's what's so remarkable about this character is that something deep down within these characters, something has broken them. They've had one bad day, one bad choice that has made them to be this character moving forward they've taken this choice and they've gone with it they've said this is the way forward and this has got the the other way we got to go and i'm going to mention ozymandias like he in watchmen is one of the best characters in watchmen and i always found him the most interesting apart from obviously rorschach because he blurs the line between you know psychopath and vigilante and good person bad person but ozymandias is a character very much like um, 006 in um, Goldeneye. He is part of the establishment who then goes against the establishment because he realises, no, in order to cure the world, you must destroy it first. And what a horrible but interesting concept that is, basically. And it's the same thing with, you know, cleansing the world with the snap of my fingers, you know, and all of these different things. And it's very, very powerful you know, form of storytelling. And I know we're going to dive deep into it later about society and, you know, what it means. But right now, what intrigues me the most about them is what we don't see or hear from them. But yet we're left to kind of interpret the adventures that they're in and maybe question along the way, which is why I do think at some times it is a mis- it is a mistake to just show a flat out origin story, in my opinion. I don't know if we agree on that. Is it, you know, do... Do we need to see the origins of these supervillains to know that, you know, and do we, should we really call them supervillains? But yet we do. Put a pin on that question because that's a, that's a question we got coming up later down the show. But um, 
Yeah, I, I, th I think you nailed on the head, Rob, because I, for me, the, one of the things I find most fascinating about these characters are their feelings, their motivations, their perspectives, and sometimes even analysis of what's going on in the world is relatable and correct, you know? Uh, very much, you know, as you said, with Thanos, like, he brings up some points where you go, well, yeah, he was actually talking a lot of truth here. But what makes them supervillains <laughs> is their solution is always horribly unacceptable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's where the storytelling uh, comes from, you know, and part of the reason why I'm fascinated by them. Like, I, I think um, of Aquaman, you know, we go to Aquaman where King Orm is motivated by what we humans are doing to the ocean and the rest of the planet. And his solution is drown the world. You know, fish are better than people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> it's it's a great observation to a problem, not acceptable solution. So <laughs> many of these stories are like that, and I think it's fascinating to discuss and pick apart. Um, but Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, pretty pretty much the, the same as as both you guys. Really, there's just so many like aspects to supervillains. There's just this it like like I said, it's the same as superheroes. Like there's so many different varieties, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, so you can always just get like, f like all the villains we've mentioned today: Palpatine, Joker, Sinestro. At their core, they are all super villains, but they're all so very different. And I think that's just what draws me into them. Same way I love the X Men, it's just because of the variety in everything. So yeah, I think that's just what draws me to them. It's just because like, I always want to see like what the writers are going to do next. Like, and like I kind of maybe disagree with rob a little bit on what he says about villains origins my view is that it depends on the villain but like certain villains sometimes like they're completely uninteresting you've no you've no no care in the world for them whatsoever you think like oh this shtick was cool once upon a time but now but then you get the victor freeze episode of batman the animated series and then all of a sudden that villain just becomes so much more so much more and i think again that is a bit of a draw to it is just that um the more you learn about these villains it's like to a degree with some of them you can build a, a certain amount of sympathy and i think that's very interesting because then when you're reading it you're just you have these conflicting thoughts in your head where you're just like what you're doing is unacceptable but damn it i kind of want you to succeed in a way because like i've watched like all your like motivations and all this and now i want to i actually kind of want to see you come to the kind of a bit like sylvie and loki realistically she is the bad guy for starting the multiverse and killing he who remains but it was the case of i wanted her to win even though i knew it was bad i wanted her to win in the end and i think that is i mean i hesitate to actually call sylvia full-on villain or anything but that is, again, the interesting point is sometimes you get villains where you're just like, yeah, they are a pure villain. And some other people can come along and say, actually, if you look at it from their point of view, they're actually on the right of this and it breeds debates. So, yeah, I think ultimately that's just what draws me to supervillains is just the variety, the diversity and the moral conflict you can brew within your own head from reading the comics. Then why do you want to kill me? to kill you what would i do without you go back to ripping off mob dealers no 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 you you complete me you're garbage who kills for money don't talk like one of them you're not even if you'd like to be to them you're just a freak like me they need you right now but when they don't They'll cast you out, like a leper. You see, their morals, their code, it's a bad joke. We've dropped at the first sign of trouble. Um, on the note, because we're talking about, you know, the origin stories and, and, and sh you know, should we see these? Because as I said, at top that, the reason we're doing this discussion is that within Hollywood now, we are seeing a trend of solo villain movies. And, you know, we got the Joker, you know, we get we had Birds of Prey. You know, movies that are just focusing on the villain. Even if you look at Disney, where they've done movies like Maleficent or the recent Cruella, where they're exploring these villains. So, uh, you know, in general, I think 
we should have villain tales definitely obviously to fight against our superheroes because i think in a way it's a cautionary tale to people like it's a presentation of morals in life saying look these if you go down this if you do these decisions you could end up like this and this is an example of what we as a human race deem unacceptable do you know what i mean so in a way they are cautionary tales but then it's interesting when you bring up the origin stories because these people are meant to be people that we don't like we you know hate these people they cause misery and harm but yet when you explore the the human side of them we almost the, like the films in a way or comics or whatever are almost trying to form some form, form of sympathy from them so rob what do you, what do you think of that aspect do you think that's right do you think we should be you know, uh, looking at these evil people and going, oh, well, you know, they were wronged, you know, and, and maybe giving them a pass with certain things. Because these were sort of questions raised with films like Joker and Cruella. It's, it comes back to what we were saying before about victims within a society. I mean, I think I think it is right that we do explore those side of things, but I do think that it's not necessarily a way of answering those questions. Because I think ultimately what leaves us more satisfied as audience members is what's um, what's left un- um, open, you know, like, so um, by the end, like I said, with Joker, it's almost like a big trick on us. The unreliable narrator structure of that piece is so masterfully done uh, to the point where we question everything we've just seen. And I think if it's too blatant and if it's too obvious, I think it kind of takes away from, I don't want to say the magic of the characters, because that's quite a weird thing to say isn't it but you know the mystery yeah the mystery yeah let's say the mystery yeah absolutely so yeah i think that's that's probably my answer to that tom what's your two cents on it again i think it's it's another case of it it depends on, on the villain like but again i think it also just depends on people because even if you're trying to evoke sympathy from people, some people, they might just gloss over them. They might just think the villain is too irredeemable for them to even consider sympathizing with them. But I think it does raise an important point of just, uh, I just think generally there's a lot of hate in this world. It needs to be a little bit more understanding. And I think we do that within like our media. We, we like I've been watching a lot of media recently, like new sort of shows coming out, which the basic crux of it is like the the grand moral they're trying to tell is to like, let go of like the chains of the past, like stop worrying about like, Oh, well he wrongs me first. Then she wronged me. And then, you know, this, that, and the other, it's all about like letting go. And so I think we do that without, this is why we're seeing, especially in Marvel comics um, over the years is we've seen a lot of villains get redeemed and they actually become more heroes. And I think it does tell a very important story of, you know, sometimes no matter how bad you think you fucked up in life, no matter all the shit you think you've done where you're like, how can people forgive me for this? There's always room for redemption. Then as Bojack Horseman teaches, you're still going to get it in the ass afterwards, but there's still redemption. So it's all okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Now Bojack Horseman, there's a villain. There's a super villain right there. But yeah, I think, like I said, depending on the villain, like, like the Joker watching his film, whilst I could understand why he had his breakdown, I didn't exactly feel a lot of sympathy because at the end of the day, he was still just straight up murdering people and then um, essentially started a citywide riot. And because you know what he then becomes, it's just like it kind of makes it hard for you to think like he's a sympathetic character. But then you do get characters like Helmut Zemo. Zemo in the Marvel films especially. He was trying to take down the Avengers, like trying to, you know, just tear them apart. How evil is that? And yet, when you find out his reasons, you're like, damn it you can you can understand it you feel that sympathy and just so yeah i think it is very important that we do dive into this side of the villains because the 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 fact is it's like if we wanted our villains just purely just like pure evil then there's just going to be a million clones around essentially and the fact is we moved out of that from the golden age this is just an opinion i like to think marvel had a lot to do with villains getting more nuance over the years purely because like they tried to make their heroes a bit more grounded in reality and thus that happened with the villains there were exceptions in the past before that with dc but i think generally that's just what i'm saying um so yeah i think it's it's always important to like steer into that side so people can learn that they can get redemption in their lives and also to maybe offer people that chance for redemption in real life 
just hope they learn the right lessons from it. That's my view anyway. And one thing that just popped into my head, because when you were talking about the sympathetic side of things there, like the one thing that just popped into my head straight away was when we watch, you know, like origin stories for our own heroes, like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, we see them first as a child most of the time. And then when we see our supervillains, like say Eric Killmonger as a child and the what he witnesses as a child, and they do say that children, well, it's a fact, you know, we learn more as children and grow from that point onwards, you know, it's obvious, right? So when we see that kind of negative imagery or the negative thoughts, or we see, you know, we, we are dealing with grief at such a point in our life, or we become victimized to something at a young stage, I think that's when they become more sympathetic. And, you know, like I said, Eric, Eric Killmonger for me is quite an excellent example of that, because I, I, I watched it not too long ago, actually, Black Panther again. And I forgot how good it was, actually. And I, I don't think a lot of people give it enough credit as well for, I mean, they do, but they don't, is what I'm saying, especially with Eric Killmonger, like some of the, I mean, some of the monologues, some of the lines and, you know, um, uh, that he delivers. They love a good monologue. A, they do love a good monologue. And, you know, I I buy everything he says and I don't I do not blame him for the person that he is at the end of the day by that point. And I think if the films can without exploiting that notion of it, because I think it is maybe a cheap cho- trope now to, you know, f- you know, th- throw in because I don't think it would have worked if we saw young Thanos, for example, or even Ozymandias or, or something like that. I'm trying to think of someone really random here, but young Lex Luthor. Yeah, well, no, actually, I think even young Lex no, Luthor that, that would be would yeah. could probably work. Cause, I mean, they did some yeah. of it with Smallville, and you and but yeah, I just think if as long as it doesn't become a trope, a cheap trope to just be okay, we're going to focus on this child's perspective of how they you know were dealt as a child, and then you feel sympathetic for them because they are a child you know, and they're at a fragile stage in their life. And that is, I think that is vital, actually, to the sympathetic side of these characters. Yeah, that's a great point to bring up, Rob, the, the child aspect of it. And I think I think it, it does have to go down to how you portray the story, really. I think, if, for example, let's look at the Joker film, Joaquin Phoenix. Like, at the beginning of the film, I did feel sympathy for the character. But by the end of the film, after his actions, you're like, okay, no, you're wrong. You should not have gone down this path. I, I can't go along with you with this. So in my opinion, anyway, the film succeeded in that it's telling a cautionary tale that this is what could happen were you to choose these routes in life sort of thing, which is why I push back when people say, oh, you know, it's going to get people all riled up and become incels and all this sort of rubbish. And I'm just like, well, it, you know, I think we've come to a stage now where most audience members are smart enough to appreciate this is entertainment, you know, and it, it is there's there's a measure of of fun as well, just to be it, just to be like you said, it's good to be bad, you know. Sometimes we just want to have fun with being bad, but at the same time, I don't. You, they have to be careful to not cross that line, and to in a way say, "Oh, this is acceptable. We're giving them a pass." You know, you can't give them a pass. They're still doing wrong deeds, but yes, create some form of sympathy and depth to understand where they're coming from even if you disagree with them that's it's just more balanced conversation so let's move away from a uh, this is quite a deep topic we were just talking about there but let's go into comedy you know because i i think there's incredible comedy potential in supervillains because when i was you know thinking about this show and doing my notes and i was thinking why i love villains like palpatine and skeletal and a lot of it has to do with comedy it, like it's that contrast that they are um, dangerous babies <laughs> throwing these tantrums that they often take the, they often take themselves so incredibly seriously do you know what I mean like not only do they wield actual power they're geniuses that they've amassed all this money or they've built a big giant ray gun <laughs> or whatever you know they, these people they have real power truly dangerous but in so, and in so many stories they are so rigid and that's what it's about they need to make the world the way they think it should be they need to make these things happen the way they want them to happen. And I just think that there's something about that rig- rigidity and that obsession that is just perfect is a perfect opportunity for comic subversion. <laughs> because if you look at Palpatine, for example, in Star Wars, 
he's he's a symbol of many things. Like we see him in the prequels as a politician. So he's like a symbol of a very frightening real world evil. You know, how a political system can be ni- manipulated to give power to one person, as we've seen in, in our own history. But then when we see him in the original trilogy, he's a wizard out of a fairy tale. He's just this space wizard in dark robes and lightning comes out of his fingers. He's almost cartoonishly fantasy. Do you know what I mean? And, and like the way Ian McDermott made the decision to play him, because I don't, he didn't get many notes from George. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as George wasn't always the best with his actors. So <laughs> it was Ian McDermott's decision to, you know, to play this guy like this and be very... Evil. So he is, he is both a picture of different kinds of real evil, like from the fear of the, and from the fear of the dark sorcerer to the fear of the false-faced politician to this cartoonishly over-the-top, almost like a panto villain. Do you know what I mean? So he represents all these things, but there is a true element of comedy to him because he's so adherently absurd. Do you know what I mean? He's so over-the-top. Um, th- does that make sense? Am I, am I hitting the point here? What do you think, Rob? That makes perfect sense. And I just own my only wish now that, first of all, we should have done an impersonation round because, I mean, you're winning by <laughs> far with your emperor. I mean... I mean, I just kind of wish that we had in The Rise of Skywalker a moment where he just went, somehow I have returned. I think that would have made it for me. I would have I would have been like, do you know what? Yes, this movie is easily the best one now. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I was joking. Before that film came out, I was joking that they'd be like, Palpatine's returned. How have you... Why have you returned? Because... <laughs> just... <laughs> Do you know what? We're, That's essentially what we got. We're, we're getting that on a t-shirt. We're getting um, power, somehow I have returned. And then on the back, because? <laughs> <laughs> um, th- the first person I think of straight away when I think of comedic villains, I mean, we, we spoke about him not too long ago, but Donner's, Richard Donner's genius of casting Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor for me, like he is, he's hamming it up and he's having an absolute blast playing Lex Luthor in in that film. Some people can read War and Peace and come away thinking it's a simple adventure story. Others can read the ingredients on a chewing gum wrapper and unlock the secrets of the universe. Love it. I love that moment in that film. And I love also, you know, please, Otis, um, grab the gentleman his cape. And all those little tropes. Oh, and um, come in, it's open. Once he's blown the door open. You know, he's ab- he's having the absolute time of his life with that. And I think many people will say who have who have played supervillains, you know, whether they were critically well received or not, they have an absolute blast playing these characters because they're they're giving a chance, given an opportunity, first of all, to tap into something that they would never. Well, let's hope that they never do. You know, there are <laughs> certain characters you never know where they get to play a bad person, and you know that is fun. I know Ewan McGregor even said he had an absolute blast playing black mask because he wasn't doing obi-wan kenobi or he wasn't doing you know another good character and and for me he was probably the most apart from obviously black canary which you and i jake we've spoken many times about (laughs) that ewan mcgregor is easily like having the time of his life in that film and it's the same with you know jim carrey is the riddler i know a lot of people give criticism for his performance he's loving it isn't he he's loving it he is absolute, and even Frank Gorshin, who even got a prime time Emmy. People don't know that. And Rob, I how, can't believe you haven't mentioned this, but Nicholson as Joker as well. Exactly. Well, I, I mentioned him at the beginning, but yeah, like you're right. Uh, Nicholson, yeah, Nicholson even got a Golden Globe nominee for it, and you know they were even saying, "Oh, could he get a BAFTA? Could he get an Academy Award?" He didn't, but like he could have. And like I said, there there has to be a fine line, I think. And I remember you guys talked about it wonderfully. Uh, on your episode about camp um there has to be that fine line between the realism the the truth of the reality of life and uh, the scene within the moment and then there's the the campness of the whole thing like even i've read in like the making of the dark knight trilogy that the first scene that heath ledger and christian bale had together was in the interrogation scene which again wonderful dialogue but the first thing they did when they called action was just laugh because you have to remember at the end of the day, there is a man dressed in a bat suit and there's a guy in clown makeup who have got to make the next five minutes of philosophical piece writing the most serious, engaging thing possible. But, you know, Heath hands it up in that moment where he goes, 
you will complete me. And it's just, it works. It, when you find that right balance between the two things, you, you create movie magic and you create supervillain movie magic right there. Hmm. Tom, what are your thoughts? I I love it when a when you can get like some real comedy out for supervillain. There's there's so many aspects of it. I like one of my favorite tropes that I think is probably more prevalent in comics is usually when like the the supervillains just got like someone helping them out who's like a little bit inept, and just like the the supervillains just constantly just like oh, <laughs> God's sake, this is what I have to work with. My other favorite trope is, and it's happened in a few comics I've read recently, is when the villain lands on Earth, makes some big, huge speech, and then he just gets hit by a Wolverine fastball special. <laughs> and it's just like a panel of him just like on the ground, just like, I really fucking hate Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I just love shit like that. As soon as I see stuff like that, I'm like, ugh. But in terms of like, you, you know, just like, like going off what Jake was saying about like hamming it up and everything and what you were saying, Rob, I have to go to the master for this for the, from Doctor Who, um, especially in New Who. So John Sim, Michelle Gomez, and Natasha Dawan, they all are all clearly having a blast with the role, um, especially Michelle Gomez. I mean, she, I, she was one of the best masters I've ever seen. I absolutely loved her in that. And it is just because they're so unhinged that just like people can be like dying around them and they just they're just cracking jokes and that. And it's it's just that just that kind of just weird surrealness of it all, and you really get that from the master as well. It's just like it, the, their humor is just so surreal, in, in a way. Just right down to like Johnson when he becomes prime minister of, of Great Britain as as the master, and like he finally gets the cabinet uh, together, and he's just like, I just want to to thank you all, thank you for just for, for jumping away from your parties, jumping on the. Harold Saxon bandwagon as soon as you could and now you're going to get your rewards and he just sits down, puts a mask on and the guy is there just like, what's that sir? And he's like, oh it's a gas mask and he's just like, well I can't hear you, just takes it off it's a gas mask, puts it back on the guy's like, well for what? He's like, for the gas what gas? This gas and then it just like sprays (laughs) out and just kills everyone in the room whilst he's just there just like doing the the four beat drumming that he's been doing all season and just it's it's sublime work because it's it solidifies him as this just pure straight up psychopath but it's just done he he does it so joyfully that even you're just like that would that what that would be a funny way to kill a bunch of people that would that would do it for me yeah so yeah i absolutely love it when supervillains get comical i mean obviously i feel like the strengths mostly lie in the drama the pathos but when they're allowed to be funny um, when there's room for that, it's always just, it's somehow a bit more satisfying than when the superheroes are doing it. Yeah, definitely. Humanity's savage nature will inevitably lead to global annihilation. So in order to save this planet, I had to trick it. With the greatest practical joke in human history. Killing millions. To save billions. Necessary crime. You know, we can't let you do that. Do that, Rorschach? I'm not a comic book villain. Do you seriously think I'd explain my masterstroke to you if there were even the slightest possibility you could affect the outcome? I mean, I, I also think that there's an aspect to it, like outside of the films, like if we're looking at it from a real world perspective, that there's something funny as well. Uh, that attaches for me supervillains and, and comedy with merchandise and action figures <laughs> and and particular Funko Pops <laughs> like uh, like because when I buy these Funko Pops I'm always more drawn to the villains because I I get so much joy from imagining Palpatine or Luthor seeing a Funko Pop of themselves and being so pissed like I'm not this cute thing with big eyes and a bubble head I am the master of <laughs> whatever <laughs> I mean and. I just really like thinking of uh, supervillains in like mundane positions. Like, because when we see them in, in stories, we always see them in that state of being operatic, of, you know, they're always making their plans, being the puppet masters at work. And we just never see them in those quiet moments of like, hey, Dr. Doom, what's your favorite chocolate bar? You know, <laughs> like, just, just knowing these, those moments. It's the Doom ha- bar. Oh! Makes it, he he makes it, it himself, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> but for me, it's just 
knowing that those moments kind of have to exist, like surely he's got a favorite chocolate bar because <laughs> these stories are often told where we spend time with the villains and we don't see those type of mundane moments. So they exist in this constant state of operatic screaming at the horizon. <laughs> and, you know, like Skeletor's always like that. And then we sp will spend time with the heroes where we'll see them, you know, have friends and have humanizing moments. And I just think I get a lot of joy of thinking about these obsessed villains <laughs> having mundane moments in their lives. <laughs> so my next question, which is a bit of a fun one, uh, start with you, Rob. If you could hear a supervillain scream about something mundane, <laughs> what would you hear them rant about? <laughs> I, I think he kind of summed it up. I would love to see a scene with Doctor Doom trying to, uh, trying to or trying to market a Doom bar. I think that would be absolutely <laughs> incredible. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. It's pronounced Doom, not Doom. <laughs> <laughs> You might have to come Now back get to the it. limited edition new god edition. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to come back to me. That's a ge it's just genius. Oh my god. Um <laughs> I mean again we've seen moments like like when as you said um when it, it, you're t he's like shouting at his um uh partner in crime like Tesmaka or um Oldersburg. Yes. Odisberg, you know, like, don't you think it would have been a bit better if you grabbed me my towel after I'm out of the bath? You know, like, the fact that we see those moments in that movie is, again, down to the writing and the genius of Donna. Again, I know I keep going on about it, but may he rest. But yeah, just, I would love to see, do you know what I would actually love to see? I would love to see uh, General Chang from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, discovering Shakespeare. Because remember that scene in that film when he's do and he's sat with Captain Kirk, and I don't know if you talk about Star Trek that much on this show, but anyway, we don't. Uh, no, yeah. but there you go. General Chang just at one point says, "To be or not to be, that is the question." And proper hams it up. And I remember Kirk even says, "Earth, Hitler, 1938." And General Chang goes, "I beg your pardon." And then, and then some Chancellor G Gorkin says. Well, I see we have a long way to go. I'm like, whoa, I can't believe we got away with that one. Okay. But I would love it if we just saw a scene of General Chang just like reading Shakespeare and going, yeah, I'll use this for a speech one day. Because that's what he does. He, he uses it in front of Kirk. And then Kirk, for some reason, uses Hitler in the conversation, which is even more bizarre. It's like a very on-the-nose moment of, yeah, you're clearly the villain because I'm going to match you with Hitler. It's like, good God. Wow, okay. Okay, you've only met him for like two <laughs> minutes in this scene, but you're going to compare him to Hitler. Wow, okay. And then, or even just have a scene where he gets out of the room and goes, did you hear what Kurt just called me? He called me Hitler. Like, I'm not <laughs> fucking having this. And that's why the undiscovered country happens. That's why he frames the Enterprise, because he called him Hitler, not because of power and greed and wanting the Federation to, to you know, to fall apart. He, he Because Kurt called him Hitler. That's why. But yeah, I guess that answers your question. That's the scene I want to see. That's a moment I want him to look back on and go, I thought reading Shakespeare would help me out. But in fact, people called me Hitler. And now I want the Federation to burn. Tom, uh, how about <laughs> yourself? What villain do you want to see complain about something mundane in life? <laughs> Honestly, just because like, I know we've, we've like just mentioned him, but just because he, he delivers just the best angry rants. It has to be Doctor Doom because he's just he's, he's just brilliant. And I'd just like to see... Honestly, I'd like to see Dr. Doom try and do my job for one day and talk to the clients. <laughs> just oh see what God. he's like after he, after he gets off the phone. He's just like... Ah! <laughs> or maybe even whilst he's on the phone, whilst the guy is just like, oh, you know, I pay you to do a service. And he's just like, fool! Doom pays this paid by no man. Just saps him through the phone. He's just like, you will get a refund. Oh, that guy. Beyond that, um, I mean, I have moments occasionally where just like, I'll go through... 10 minutes in a day where just small tiny things happen like i'll drop something i'll stub my toe the door won't like open correctly or won't lock properly and it just always really gets me so again i'd like to see someone like doom just have a morning like that 
just like I don't know, he gets like like cereal ready to to come out, and he just drops a spoon on the floor, and it just like just goes into a mad rage, attacks the Avengers, <laughs> and they're just like, "What? What is your plans, dude? What are you doing?" It's just I'm just really pissed off. I dropped the spoon. And it's like, what? <laughs> this spoon has wronged me for the last time. <laughs> It's like, I will become a god so that no spoon can defeat Doom. <laughs> so, yeah. And then he'd get really mad when people wouldn't buy his chocolate bar. Oh, like, Fools, I can't even handle that! <laughs> <laughs> I made it nougat! <laughs> oh. oh, that's a good, good answer. Good answer, Tom. Um, I think, you know... I think this sort of mundane things that they do, I kind of, I think it's part of my attraction to Skeletor, like why I like Skeletor has <laughs> been so much oddly, like because in in like he, Masters of the Universe, you know, we see him rant and rave, and we often see him having like the meetings with his hedge people and giving them assignments, and he's always sort of frustrated by their failure. Uh, so I guess there is a little bit of mundane in that. There's this like contrast where he'll be like i will gather all the power and take everything from he-man and then beast man will like do something dumb and he'll be like you boob <laughs> so i just <laughs> i just think like there's this great contrast between like he's an absolute super villain megalomaniac but he also sounds like an office manager <laughs> mad at merman because he didn't file the paperwork correctly he's like you bumbling boob <laughs> like and like every time you see him he's just always got his like hands on his face like i'm surrounded by morons like he just feels like this mundane office manager that just has to deal with idiots <laughs> oh. could you imagine a scene of darth vader like trying to stop his um like um, TV service or something. He's like, no, no, I don't want the 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 the, the galactic um, channels. I just want this channel. That's all I want. I want, <laughs> I want GNN. I want Galaxy Network News. That's all I want. I don't want any other channel. I mean, uh, yeah, that would be incredible. Just to thank that. you very much, Mister Vero. Thank you very shopping for Galaxy <laughs> New Network. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 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 so emperor i have some news uh <laughs> <laughs> i told you to get cable <laughs> <laughs> how will they know when i've returned um <laughs> in order to ensure the security and continuing stability the republic will be reorganized into the first galactic Empire for a safe and secure society. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Supervillains, you know, are often seen as different and as outcast and a lot of the time, especially in like Hollywood, a lot of the time supervillains are often scarred or deformed in some way, that, and that this is often the thing that sets them apart. Like, while often heroes, even if they're weird or quirky, are often you know more coded as traditional, straight jaw. You know, they're sort of pristine in a way. So, do you think this aspect makes the villain more interesting, or do you think in a more well, modern society that we live in in 2021 it's an old stereotype that maybe doesn't fit anymore because you know it, it in a way it's sort of sign signifying that villainous people are associated with with disab disability you could say and some form of scarring or def or deformed about them so what do you make of that rob this is a really tough question because it's you know we have to be kind of careful with what we say in a way do you know what I mean? Because it's like, how for, like, because I don't know why it just popped into my head, but the first thing that popped into my and I think it's because you and I talk about this all the time, Jake, is that we we talk about Batman Returns a lot and how we've got the perfect kind of, you know, the look between the two characters. You've got one character who's abandoned and the one who's lost their parents, and yet one person has lost their parents because they threw them into a you know, sewer thing, and then they've become deformed and changed into, you know, and they've had, they were born with disfigurements and, um, you know, and there's that wonderful speech from the Penguin that he's given to the news saying, you know, so my parents got scared because I was a little different, 
you know, and I think, sadly, I do think it's, uh, you know, it's really tough. I think it is an old stereotype now. And I think in modern texts, we're trying to push forward into more psychologically in-depth characters rather than focusing more on the physical disfigurements. And I think those stories are important in some way. Um, but I think, like now, I think, as you said, uh, Jake, I think, or as is, as is suggested in your question, is that it is a stereotype now. I think that does need to be pushed um, elsewhere. Because I think, as uh, remind me, Doctor Doom himself is scarred, isn't he? That's yeah, that's, that's right. why yeah. he wears that's why he wears what he wears. And yeah, I'll probably have a better answer with more of discussion. But like for me at the moment, the thing that kind of st- strikes me is that I think. With previous examples, like I said, with Batman Returns, I've, what I really love about that film is that it actually does highlight that he's still human at the end of the day, despite seen as a, a little different. And um, um, that's more the sympathetic side coming out there. Tom, what do you make on this? And I know it's uh, it's a complex situation, but... Um... Yeah, it's like I think the best way I can start my discussion on this is by using an example I saw recently because we talked about Dr. Doom and how like he is scarred um it has varied over the years how like extreme it's been um but in a recent comic I've read so basically at the start of Slot's run on a Fantastic Four so fairly recent comic and uh basically the whole thing is Doom is trying to put Latveria in prime position on the world he's captured the Fantastic Four He's downed Galactus and he's managing to like feed off the energy of Galactus. And he's going to be basically saying he's going to share it with the world and all this and the other. Obviously, the Fantastic Four are trying to stop him because they're like, you can't hold Galactus. But in order to help escape, Invisible Woman basically, whilst all the eyes of the world are on Doom, she makes his armor invisible so that everyone can see what he truly looks like under the armor. And I was reading that and I, I was kind of reading it going, I don't really know how to rectify what you've done there, Susan. That kind of seems, I mean, I know it's doom. I get that. And I get like, you got to try and stop him and do what you can. But equally, I mean, that's not so much a problem for Sue. That's more Dan Slott writing it. Like, I, I, I don't know. I just, I really took issue with it. I really had a proper issue with it. Where I was just like, why did this have to be the way you defeated him? It feels cheap. And I, yeah, it feels very cheap. And also because like, the whole reason, I think as well, because the whole reason Doom went evil is because he went through a lot of shit with his mother and during like his attempts to like try and you know rescue her, you know, he gets these scars and he starts getting more over the years. And just because he is a very vain person, that has a psychological effect on him. And obviously seeing Reed about that has a psychological effect on him as well. So yeah, it just does feel really cheap to just go out and say like, all right, we're going to stop him by just making it so all the worlds can laugh and point at his like scars and deformities. I it just didn't sit right with me, and I have to say there have been a lot of comics I've been reading like recently over the past few years where if they do bring a villain back whose whole basis was like around some deformity or some, they'll at least address it. Like even if they don't give the villain a full redemption, so like oh they're a hero now, we're just not a villain anymore they will at least address it in the way that makes the reader like think to themselves, ah, yeah, I never thought of it like that before. Another prime example is when you're reading uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. Now, granted, this was written in 2001, 2002, but it's one of the first arcs with Kingpin, and there's a segment where Spider-Man literally just reads out a whole list of, like, you're so fat jokes. Yes, I remember this. Obviously, early 2000s, that humor was kind of acceptable, but, like, rereading it now, it's kind of like, Again, I know it's Kingpin. I know he's a dickhead, especially in the Ultimate Universe. Ultimate Kingpin is just not really that redeemable. It just still felt just like, you know, you're better than this, Spider-Man. You're better than this. So I think it is definitely something that needs to be looked at when they're basing villains around, like, they've got some form of deformity or just something about them that, like, makes them visually, like, different to people. Um, I think that does need to be looked at and maybe nipped in the bud unless they can somehow like show respect to what the character has gone through and still make them a compelling villain without it necessarily being like, ooh, he is the hook-handed man. On the flip side of that, though, I think it is kind of important, though, to have 
villains who stand outside the norm of society. Mm-hmm. You know, you're kind of your countercultures and all that. I think it is important because like that at the end of the day, if they were with uh, going along with society, they wouldn't be villains, really. I mean, well, they might be, but they just might be running Amazon. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, wow. So yeah, so when when you go into a, a you don't you don't want to. I mean, okay, I guess Lex Luthor is kind of an exception, but at the same time, he's not like normal people because he's vastly more intelligent. So that already sets him aside. But it is very important to have that because. Again, that's when you get the conflict then and the whole like, ooh, is the villain right all along? When you're being forced to think about what society is and the way it like pushes down on people, when it makes you like really go, oh, hang on a minute, then it's important for the villain to be a sort of counterculture figure. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, give them like deformities or disabilities and make that like this big scary thing about it because you know, people in real life with those conditions, they're not scary. They're people who've either been through some shit or were just born that way. Either way, there's nothing evil there. So yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely something that needs to be looked at. But as I say, so long as you know, the villain does usually need to be very counterculture. But Yeah, uh, I think it's um it's a it's you know it's a complex problematic part of it that, you know, where anything physically different has been coded with super villains and bad choices but i'm also i'm going to play maybe devil's advocate here and look at it from a different perspective where almost everybody i have ever met you know uh, grows up feeling like i am not meeting whatever ideal there is you know Uh, so i think almost everybody grows up with a little bit of like you know i feel a little outside the norm so Mm. which is i think that's just projected on all of us that's just sort of how society works and so sometimes that makes the villain more relatable in a way because they are more fun more colorful they they kind of wear what they whatever they want to wear and you know they are loud and proud and they are saying exactly what they believe and what the world should be and i think there's something freeing in that so there's a, there's a sense of being loud and proud of your scars of your disability and it's interesting that you brought up the uh, Danny DeVito's performance as the penguin because when I think of this point of view, I think of at the end of the film where he does a 180 and he goes, I am an animal. Mm. You know, he's sort yeah. of, he's embraced who he actually is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And he's loud and he's proud about it. He's come to terms. I cannot be like these people. That is not who I am. Mm. You know, this yeah. is who I am. I am an animal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and I think there's something powerful in that to also represent so I that that's why it's a complex problem because you know on one hand yes in Hollywood it's been used as stereotypes and maybe gone Ooh, you know that, that's not quite you know what you should be using it for but at the same time we also have to allow for representation with people with disabilities with people with scars and things like that which as we've seen in the past Hollywood has shined away from mm. you know what I mean so there's an element of that as well I think but this, this is why it's a complex, you know, mm. situation. So um, to make it, you know, a, a bit more fun, let's uh, let's uh, bring it more back up a bit. So um, because, you know, we're talking about how villains express themselves and, you know, and, I, you know, I find villains more fun and more expressive a lot of the times than the heroes because they are just weirder, you know. Uh, you know, they have these elaborate, very colorful costumes, sometimes much more than the heroes. So my question to you guys is that, if you were going to dress like a supervillain, if you were going to express your obsession or the way you think the world should be, like tenny, take any societal concerns about what is too much. Do you know what I mean? So, Rob, how would you express yourself in costume? What is your <laughs> obsession <laughs> that you would display in costume? <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm kind of already doing it <laughs> with this uh, <laughs> this particular... Uh, um, how fitting, eh? Though... I, I think I love the air of flamboyancy within these characters. You know me. I've always said that. Like when there's that this balance between serious and camp with uh, between the two, you, you can strike gold. And I think, as I've mentioned before, the Joker's attire can be changed. And as long as we're getting a decent performance within out of it, it doesn't really matter what he wears. Apparently it does when he's got 
tattoos all over his body, however. <laughs> so <laughs> there is that. That I probably would not put damaged on my forehead because I think that's probably too subtle. Um, <laughs> but as I said, mate, I think I'm probably already doing it right now. And um, if you excuse me for just one second, I might just do a quick costume change. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Jake, you, you saw this on my birthday, I'm afraid. But, I've uh, seen this. Yeah, you're going to see it right now. Hold on. Ugh, this is going to be so entertaining for people to listen to. So please excuse me. <laughs> oh, yeah. People um, on well, audio, we, we do apologize. Uh, this one. This oh, one, there it is. This oh. old favorite of mine. Oh. There it is. So, uh, yeah. Let's put that for one For those on. of you who, who can't see, he's wearing a uh, onesie. Right <laughs> <laughs> Meaning yeah. everybody that can't see. So. <laughs> And, um, you know, if you want to show you're the smartest guy in the room, then you've got to wear a, a blazer full of question marks, which is what I'm doing right now. And, uh, you know, whether it's a onesie or a suit, a well-tailored <laughs> suit, that's one thing that I love about these. I think that's the thing that's consistent with the, all the superheroes, um, super villains, sorry, I should say, that I've uh, chosen, is that they've all got a good tailor. You know, that somewhere there's a good tailor out there. Um, you know, even Joker even says at one point, um, you know, it, it wasn't cheap. You bought it. And um, again, you've got to figure out how, how on earth they got these costumes. You know, where did hey, they man, get them made? Hey, man, look, Palpatine, he's oozing in evil. But those are some nice silk dark robes he's got under. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I like the fact in Revenge of the Sith, he turns it on the inside out and it goes from red to black. I love yeah. that. I love, I love the moment. I like obviously Rise of Skywalker's controversial, but this one moment when he's draining the life force of Ray and Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know when he, and then he he becomes like you know fully formed. Mm -hmm. He's also constructed himself a brand new outfit. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. With, with a nice little bit of red down the middle. He's like, yeah, it's... I'm back, and I got new Dugs. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have known that the Force had such great power? <laughs> oh. Tom, where do you go with this? How would you express your obsessions in costume? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've always, I've always kind of like thought to myself, if I was to become a supervillain, I would dress like I was auditioning for the role of the Doctor, and just, just wear something completely flamboyant, but also just like, as you said, well tailored as well. I'd also like to say that I probably dress kind of like Captain Flint in Black Sails, if you've either of you have ever seen that, if anyone's ever seen that. I'm sure if I put on a bit more muscle and shaved my head, I'd actually make a good Captain Flint thinking about it. But yeah, I would just I would just like want to be sort of I'd want people to look at me and just think, damn it, I hate him, but he just looks so cool. <laughs> They're just like, even his shadow. Oh my god. You know, I just want people to take notice and just be like, right, I'm going to pay attention to whatever this guy says, even if I don't agree with it. And then they're like, all right, I still don't agree with it. And yet I'm still here just, just basking in his glow. That's the kind of supervillain I'd be. I'd be like Jesus, but evil. What a sentence. <laughs> what a sentence. I mean, you've had some cracking one-liners tonight, but that is, that's, go Thank you. that's going on a T-shirt. That is definitely going on a T-shirt. <laughs> Jesus, but evil. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my Isn't goodness. that what um, Justice League was about? Oh, Whoa. Oh. So, oh. Uh, I, you know, for for myself, I think I would go really comical. I think mine would be something along the lines of like, like I would be a villain in the Batman sixty six show. Oh <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> I think I would be like a bookman, where because my obs I love reading books and I I always think people should read more books. You know, go to your bookstores, buy books, knowledge, reading, literature, English, all that wonderful stuff. So I would just be covered in books and like the like the books would just be flapping and that pages would be going everywhere. And if somebody would be like say something stupid, I'd be like, here, have some knowledge, and like throw <laughs> them a book. And like a book would just implant them with knowledge. Ah, oh, like <laughs> yeah. So I think that would be mine, Bookman. See, what we call God depends upon our tribe, Clark Joe. Because God is tribal. God takes sides. No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fists and abominations. Mm -mm. I figured out way back. God is all powerful. He cannot be all good. And if he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. And neither can you be. They need to see the fraud you are with their eyes. The blood on your hands. I want to sort of uh, bring it back to what we were discussing near the beginning, that 
supervillains can sometimes often be right about a problem that but they always have a horrible solution so often in stories like the villain often represents an agent of change so i'm 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 playing like again devil's advocate here the villain represents an agent of change while the heroes are agents of stasis in a lot of stories so it's moral and noble because the villain is going to blow something up and the hero says no you're not going to do that uh, but that means that I think we've had lots of storytelling that reinforces change is scary and keeping things the same is great. You know, which I don't know if that's a great thing for us <laughs> to to culturally internalize. Like, uh, so, like, do you think we should think a little bit more about like supervillains in society? Like, not constantly looking at what needs to be protect. Like, yes, you know, worry about what about protecting things, obviously but also asking ourselves what should change. Do you know what I mean? So like, like I'm interested in us as a society that, we ha that we're having balance. So obviously there are things we should protect, but also realizing that a lot of things that we want to happen that are good come from change, I think anyway. And I think it goes to the heart of this idea that sometimes the supervillains have figured out and observed an actual problem. Like, you know, sometimes not, you know, sometimes villains do just want to take over the world because or out of vengeance and i'm not saying all supervillains have a point but there's an interesting thing to me where we should try to tell more stories where maybe the heroes should be agents of change in a way because i believe you know we will only progress as a species if we change things so this is why um you know we, we brought him up earlier one of the reasons i think people really appreciate killmonger in black panther is that so he brings up this specific idea of change in Wakanda and the world, you know. Granted, he has an unacceptable, violent version of doing that. <laughs> uh, and But it's one of those rare films where the villain is stopped, the problem is pointed out and is appreciated by the hero. And then the hero finds a better way to address the problem the villain has brought up. That's why I think what makes Black Panther so unique as well amongst a lot of other superhero films, that... Like, the villain needs to be stopped but from, from doing the violent thing, but sometimes the villains have a point, and we should find a positive way to make that change. Does that make sense to you, or, or, or am I off base here? Rob, what do you no, think? No, I'm, I'm, I'm following it, man. I was loving it. Um, honestly, I could hear you talk about that for a <laughs> <Okay>. lot longer. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a very, very good point. And I, I think you're right. This is Because this is honestly something I've been thinking for, for years in my reading of comics. Is just so often it's just like you have a villain who you know wants to change things and the superhero stops it. I think Jake summed it up perfectly. Heroes are agents of stasis, villains are agents of change, and I think we are kind of internalizing that whole thing of change is scary. Stick to the status quo, and even sometimes in stories where the hero is maybe going, "Oh, but things do need to change." That's all that's commented on, and things don't actually change. This is why Batman will never be... Able, this is why Bruce Wayne actually would never be able to fix Gotham the way lots of people on the internet seem to think he'd be able to, ignoring the fact that it's fictional. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think we, we definitely need some more stories where either the villain kind of wins and people go, actually, even though what you did was fucked up, the change that has become because of it is actually... A good thing and maybe we should we should stick to this clean up his mess but maybe we should like consider this idea or have a hero be an agent of proper change the issue is is whenever comics have a hero become an agent of change he's framed as a villain mm. or a hero turned wrong i think one of the best examples i can kind of think of to support my point is and this is a very left field pick i don't even know if you two will appreciate it but in artemis fowl especially the very first artemis fowl book the mate, the title character, Artemis Fowl, is a villain. That's literally the whole basis of, of the book is he is a villain and he ends up winning. That's the big like twisting of it. And he does. He he basically discovers the fairy world, kidnaps someone, keeps them hostage, forces these fairies to like show themselves, and he just like manipulates them perfectly so he ends up winning. And through that, the fairy world is changed forever they now have to accept that there is a human up there who knows that they shit about them and can act on them. And it actually ends up becoming a positive change for that world because like throughout it, they have more interactions with Atmos. Atmos grows as a person and eventually just, you know, they Atmos does turn into more of a good character. 
But I do think, you know, we do need to see a, maybe a little bit more of that, maybe a big event where the resolution isn't the heroes have won. Maybe the resolution is, right, well, we stopped the villain, but the change has happened. Now we need to kind of like figure out how we live in this world. And then it's them just like going through that. And maybe that will then in turn make people realize, okay, maybe we don't stick to the status quo, as High School Musical once said. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe we, we do need to actually have some actionable change because otherwise this planet is going to catch on fire and kill us all. Um, I think a perfect example of this is um, Infinity War, right? Now, where the villain wins. Now, obviously, there's, a, there's technically a part two to that story, mm -hmm. but you could easily watch Infinity War as a standalone comic book film where the villain wins, Yeah, you know? And you, and you see where the villain's point of view is coming from, which is why I really appreciate what Marvel are doing now, especially what they're addressing in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that show where the repercussions, yes, we stopped Thanos, we brought everyone back, but what did that cost us? <laughs> you know, suddenly people's lives are different. Do you know what I mean? Uh, we've, we've lived for five years, we've, you know, we've changed, we've adapted, and all of a sudden these people in power want things to go back to the way things were. Mm -hmm. weirdly kind of relevant to real life situation at the minute mm -hmm. um you know what i mean so you have to wonder about these things that oh yeah you know they had a point though mm -hmm. they had a point but, but, but what do you think rob about this agent of change and stasis so interesting enough th there was one character i did want to bring up like from the very beginning but i decided to go with joker to kind of get him out of the way in a way because you know what i mean like he's because he's he's the well known and whatever but he's in the hall of fame exactly yeah. he's in the hall of fame and but the one that i would easily put in the hall of fame and s strangely enough even though he is listed as a super villain in my eyes he is one side of an argument which is still going on to this day and that's eric lencher as magneto and you have two friends Charles Xavier and Eric Lencher, who have different ideologies of what it means to be a mutant and what it means to live in this society. And while one has very extreme ideas of how we go forward in actually bringing equality, the other uh, believes that there is a coexistence with, with the, the humans or the homo sapiens and uh, the mutants. And for me, that's why the X-Men has always intrigued me um, a lot, as well as, you know, the Batman universe for me, because as a person of colour, to be seen as a little different, and yet you've got these characters who are, you know, multi-ethnic, and, you know, they happen to have these powers, but then they're seen as even weirder and more different. And yet you've got two characters who have both suffered in many ways, and in Magneto's case, and even horrifically worse ways. And yet... There are times where I'll look at Magneto and think, I I completely and a hundred percent agree with your notion. It's almost do you know what's really genius about the X-Men? Is that they're basically, you know, the Martin Luther King and the Malcolm X kind of perspective on things. Martin Luther King's thing is, you know, we can go forward with words and not having to have violence. Whereas Malcolm would say, violence is used in self-defense, that's intelligence. And that's kind of what I see from the flip side of with Magneto and Charles Xavier is those two opposing arguments. And it's a, an argument and a discussion that sadly, I think, will be discussed for a long time. But we need characters like Magneto to open the door and open that discussion even further, because at the end of the day, in their whole heart and heart, all they want is to be treated as an as an equal within this world. And yet they don't because they're seen as different. Sorry, that's really deep, but yeah, that's why I oh, think yeah, that's, that's that's that goes I'm, point I'm, with what you guys were saying before. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad Magneto finally got a, a mention. I can't believe I hadn't mentioned him yet, but uh, <laughs> it is a very good point because he's an incredibly complex villain. I think you knit, hit the nail right on the head with everything you said there. I'm not sure what to add to it really. But this is this is it. This is why the whole concept of supervillains is so fascinating because you have Magneto, such a complex character, and then you have Goldfinger, <laughs> who you know he just wants everything because it's gold. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> because you know that's. But we still love them both equally, just because for different reasons. Mm. So this is this is the the complex part of it. So um, 
Right, this is another sort of fun question, but you know, we're veering on, ooh, what would what would I do? So um if you took something you felt passionately about, but pursued it in a dangerous way like a supervillain, what might you do, Rob? Oh god, um <sighs> I need an example, like, because I can't even think, like, what, like. Cause... Well, I've, I've got, I, I had, I had like a sort of moment as I was thinking about this, and I was, I went to the shops the other day, and it was just very crowded, and not many people wearing masks. Well, dear. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was like, you know what? I wish I had the power to just go zap, and that a mask is on their face, mm. like, boop, like, you know, it's a very real world situation, but you know, it's. <laughs> Uh, you know, it because it can be dangerous because you know, you know, because then I'm thinking, but you know, they could have valid reasons for not wearing the masks. Uh, you know, they could be exempt for also. So I'm just, it's a very complex sit- question, I think, because you're like, I really want to get this done, but what are the <laughs> what are the consequences behind it? You know what I mean? Mm. Oh, that's a really f- <sighs> see. I like your example because actually, what you're doing is good deep down you're actually (laughs) helping people rather than actually (laughs) being a bad person because what you're what you're doing is uh the bad thing that you're doing is just but but at the same time i'm taking away that person's agency exactly you're basically taking away their choice that's what you're doing and i that's why i quite like your example oh do you know what i'm in the cinema and someone is chewing so loudly I'll just let them choke for <laughs> 10 seconds on that popcorn. And, and then, yeah, literally like that. Like, zoom, like Darth Vader. Yeah, yes. yeah. I find your lack of eating disturbing. I, uh, overeating disturbing. And just, yeah, overeating. <sighs> just, yeah, just for a split second. And then you'd probably tell me to, to stop. And I'd be like, as you wish. Uh, and uh, <laughs> release him immediately. Um, but yeah, some, I, something I, like I that. I felt that pain. <laughs> yeah, just, oh God, that... I was in the cinema not too long ago and I watched um, Black Widow and there was some guy at the front just talking all the way through. And luckily there was um, a woman brave enough to just go up to him and just say, can you shut up? And I'm like, there's a hero right there. But so, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stick with force choke. <laughs> my force answer. choke in the cinema. Force <laughs> choke in the cinema. We'll go with that. Tom, what about yourself? I mean, you've heard our example, so you can be as, as silly and <laughs> mundane as you like. That's that's the thing. After hearing your guys, I'm just like, mine is like probably way too real. I'm going to stick with it anyway. Now, I want to preface this by saying this doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be murder involved. <laughs> Here we go. But if I became a supervillain tomorrow and I had the means to, by the end of the day, there would be no more billionaires. Like I said, doesn't necessarily involve murdering them, but that wealth is getting redistributed one way or another. Because, like, no matter how villainous I can get, I will never be as morally bankrupt as a billionaire. So, there we go. That's true. That's true. So it's like, to some people, I'm evil. To others, I'm like Robin Hood's. Um, but for reals, I'm just mainly doing it for the lulls. Subtle. I mean, an <laughs> agent of chaos, an agent of chaos, you could say. Oh. <laughs> I would t- totally just be like chaotic evil, chaotic neutral, or something. Just like just doing things. I'd be like Loki, basically. Just like this could be funny, whack, and <laughs> uh, uh, just pay off everyone's uh, student debts. And uh, yeah, be fantastic. I mean, it's a good cause. It's a very good cause. But at the same time, very illegal. So <laughs> <laughs> super villain. <laughs> and like I said, it doesn't necessarily involve murder. I know I keep using the word necessarily, but uh you're you're, you're not yeah. helping yourself in this situation, Tom. <laughs> well, this, look, sometimes sometimes the the world needs someone who's willing to do the things that normal people aren't willing to do. And in this case, I'm willing to redistribute the wealth of the billionaires in the world, possibly with murder, but not necessarily. Now you respect me because I'm a threat. That's the way it works. Turns out there are a lot of people, whole countries who want respect, and they will pay through the nose to get it. How do you think I got rich? I invented weapons, and now I have a weapon that only I can defeat. And when I unleash it, I'll get... You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it. Another thing I love about supervillains is the monologues. (laughs) Oh. Uh, I I think you know I think I had a better vocabulary growing up because compared to like some of the other kids around me because I was reading all these comics and like watching a lot of like genre film and TV 
And I just love that villains like Doctor Doom, they love alliteration and they and that using the big words is part of who they are. Like, I'm so smart and nobody appreciates it, so I will use very large words always, all the time. <laughs> and, they, and also, like, the monologuing, that, that it is a specific... Uh, traits of all of this that you know it's coming from a sense of injury injury you know a sense of vanity absolutely uh, but i just feel like it's part of the character as a person that they'll just run to anybody do you know what i mean they <laughs> they'll go to starbucks and they'll be like i'll have a latte and this is why that i'll make it myself and that i'll pro- <laughs> you know but i can it's just you know you can just imagine them wanting to monologue it's just that, uh, they just want to talk to you and reveal it <laughs> Um, so I don't know what it is. I just love when villains monologue and use these big words. It's just something about them. But Tom, what do you make of that aspect? I mean, yeah, like I, I, I obviously love when a villain monologues. Like I said, just like Doom's always the best for monologuing because ninety nine percent of them start with him just going fool, and then he just like reels off from there. I mean, the Joker gets some absolutely fantastic monologues. Mm-hmm. I mean, obvious choice, but the Killing Joke, like the whole thing where he's just like you know, going on about, like, if I have to have an origin story, I'd prefer it to be multiple choice. Leading up to him just, like, pointing out to Batman, just, like, don't you get it? Like, like just this this world is, is, is all a big joke, so why aren't you laughing? And obviously it was just because Batman had heard it before. But the fact is, like, the monologues themselves, it just they always draw you in and it gives you, like, a better understanding of the villain. And, yeah, I do sometimes get the sense, with some villains especially, that they are just waiting they're just waiting for someone to give them a reason to monologue. Like someone just going, oh, mate, have you got a light there? You fool! <laughs> and then you're just like going on. This is why my lighter is the best and it will control the world! <laughs> it's like, I stole this flame from the heart of Mephisto himself. And just, like, uh, Dude, yeah. I just want a light. <laughs> fool! Flames are full team. Like, All right, here's your latte. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine if it was Storm in that situation? Power of lightning, release your lightning onto the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what happens just, to a cigarette when it's struck oh, by no. lightning? <laughs> the same no. thing that happens to everything else. <laughs> oh, God, what have I done? What have I done? Oh. You've unleashed it, Rob. Oh, no. You did it. You unleashed that. Oh, I, I, I'll take, yeah, I'm sorry. It I came, it came oh. up. It came up. I, that's I staying. Love- that's I love quoting that. I love quoting I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So uh, final question of the podcast. So on superheroes, uh, supervillains monologuing, I'll go to you first, Rob. (laughs) Uh, If you could have any supervillain on a podcast, what supervillain would you want to hear rant on a podcast? (laughs) Oh, my goodness me. What a question that is. Wow. That's... Do you know what? I, I, I think... Oh, God, that's so tough. Why did you choose me first? Um, <laughs> um, do you know what? I, I would bring on... Oh, this is so tough. Because I want to say Doctor Doom because of the Doom Bar thing, because it's so good. But... <laughs> <laughs> just so just so we could talk about marketing strategy and be like, yeah, so um we'll have you just posing with your cape and everything and it'll be absolutely fabulous. And uh you know, and um yeah, we could just talk about that if anything. Um no, I think actually I I'll be honest with you, I think having someone like Lex Luthor on a podcast would be absolutely incredible, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. Like because you would have not only just some great one-liners, but you'd also have someone who's very jittery to the point where you're like, wait, what did you just say? Was it actually important what you said or was it actually just intelligent? You know, like, was it, you know, it it doesn't matter if you bring on like Gene Hackman style Lex Luthor or you bring on Jesse Eisenberg Lex Luthor, you're going to be bound to have someone nutty to the point where you're going to have good, com- you know, a good conversation between the two. And plus you know some there will be moments there where you're like i don't really fully agree with what you're saying but actually i know that you could probably build something that would destroy me in my sleep so i'm not gonna like disagree with what you're saying no so you know it's it's kind of like you've got to treat them like the perfect guest don't you really like definitely would not have the joker on because uh after the whole um murray <laughs> show incident or um no the other no, one yeah. in the dark knight returns because that would be even more chaotic um but yeah i'm gonna stick with um lex luther and uh yeah and at least we know he'd be sharply dressed and we would talk about our suits 
and, and, and in this podcast, is he mainly just complaining about Superman? <laughs> oh, of course. I, I mean, I think there has to be a conversation of, at least about Superman at some point. Yeah, for sure. But I wouldn't be surprised if Otis at one b- point like bumped the microphone and he just like it was just sorry, Mister Luthor. Yeah, oh, sorry, Mister Luthor. <laughs> giving him his newspapers <laughs> or something, and just he's like. <laughs> Just um, oh no, he gives him something and says, "Can you mention this for my own um, thing?" And he says, "Otisburg um, chocolate bar, Otisburg, Otisburg." I, I would just love it's Doctor Doom's chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> you fool! You fool! <laughs> oh goodness me, Tom! What about who do you want to hear rant on a podcast? <laughs> I can only think of one option, and I'm definitely going to bring him up because he's not being brought up yet, and I think that's outrageous. But I think he'd be a great guest because he's 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 witty. He'd have a lot to rant about. Me and him would have a lot to rant about as we have a similar enemy in life. It's Aobard Thorn, Reverse Flash. I, I definitely have to have him on there. I mean, he's got knowledge of the future as well. Imagine the things he could teach us. And also, because I could just be like, so Aobard, you know, just just... Why is Barry Allen like that? And he just went, I don't know, man. I don't know. He's just such a dick. And I'm like, he's, he's right. He's like, like, Wally is the best Flash, clearly. Oh, yeah, clearly, clearly. I, mean, I think it would just be a great, great um, rep- rapport between us, the two of us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Eobard Thorne, Reverse Flash, is my pick for podcast co-host. Probably just because the series has just finished and he's he's been talking a lot in that series. But Loki. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say Kang. Um, no, not Kang. But that's also a good... both of them? Uh, that's also a both good... Uh, you know, two guests on. Why not? Yeah. Uh, but I think with Loki that you would just present him with any um, situation and he'd be like, well, this is absurd. And this is why I, with my glorious purpose, will make this better. And he will just go on and on and on and on and half of it's lies so you don't even know what he's talking about so that's and the and then you know before you know it an hour has gone by and you've only asked one question so yeah uh, look, and that look, question look. was about what would you do with warner brothers right now <laughs> <laughs> whoa whoa god this podcast is on fire <laughs> shots fired everywhere <laughs> oh, taking everyone down we've we've become the super villains guys we, this has been our origin story <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say, surely in that moment, it would be Alligator Loki that would go in, like, in that moment, surely. <laughs> right? Don't don't have to discuss with them. It's just bring him in. like <laughs> Bring him in. I mean, he's yeah. just there. He's just, he's just chilling. There. He's in he a doesn't... pool. He's fine. He's Yeah, he's chilling by the pool. <laughs> right, I mean, I did tell you guys that this was going to be a slightly chaotic episode <laughs> of How Food Goes. <laughs> but I hope you all had fun. <laughs> Rob, thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, as always, to get your takes on things. Oh, it's been it's been an absolute blast, um, as always. And it's always great being on here with you guys and just chatting about films, comics and a lot of nerdy stuff. And, um, you know, this kind of comes back to what I've always said before, but like it's just good to just be yourself um, like most of the time. And um, this is where I get to really do that and kind of showcase that. And uh, like most of the villains that we spoke about, that's all they want to be as well is... uh, they just want to be who they want to be, and uh, it's good to be bad. So, uh, yeah. It's a great way. Brought it back. It's a great way. Brought and, it back. Uh, brought it back. Full circle over here. So, yeah. Thank you, Rob, for coming on, and thank you all for listening. And, you know, thank you for bearing with us. It has been a chaotic episode, but if you stuck with us till the very end, we appreciate that. And we also appreciate you coming on board, listening to us discuss and geek out. But if you want to continue the conversation with us, and see what we're getting up to. Rob, let's go to you first. What have you got going on at the minute, and where can the people follow you? Uh, So I'm currently um, still promoting Living in Crime Alley, which is my Batman fan film, which you can check out on YouTube. Um, I've also made a documentary, uh, which was made in the first national lockdown, which is still going through the festival circuit. Um, And you guys can check me out on Instagram at at Rob Ailing, or on Twitter at at Rob Ailing Film. And as of right now, I'm also working on my debut feature film, which is really exciting, very stressful, but ultimately so much fun. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's me right now. Yes, And we will um, we will be bringing you back very soon, Rob, um, in relation to to <laughs> what you just discussed, you know, about filmmaking stuff. So stay tuned for that, people. Uh, Tom, what about yourself? What are you getting up to? Where can the people find you? 
Well, you can find me on Twitter at Gapperboy, where I will just be posting more and more awesome uh, comic panels, terrible opinions, and campaigning for things that will never happen in the MCU. <laughs> you know what? No, I bring it back to Cap. People, now is the time for Cap Wolf campaign to be r- brought back from the dead. I'm starting it all again in earnest, especially now that Jake has given me access to the uh, Capes and Cowls uh, Twitter account. So now it's official. <laughs> Can't you can't stop me, Jake? Short of changing that password, you cannot stop me. I've already been kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, super villain power. He's finally <laughs> <have> crept in. <laughs> I'm on Twitter now. <laughs> <laughs> Angry rants into. Can you imagine those super villains wanting to monologue on Twitter? Damn this character limit. I, I, Don't you mean just I, Donald Trump's Twitter feed? Damn it! You beat me to it. I was just about to say that. God he's damn done it. it. He's done it. Oh. He's done it. <laughs> to get a pretty early to sneak in a Donald Trump oh. joke faster than me. Damn it. God. Had to get in there it. right at the end. Had to get in there. Uh, right. Uh, as for myself, you can also find me on Twitter at Sweaty Jake. And I'm also on Letterbox at Jake Hart to get all my film reviews on there. And you can also follow the show on Twitter at Capes, Cows, and Masks. And we're also on Facebook at Capes, Cows, and Masks. And as for another show I do, if you want to check that out, if you're Star Wars fans, check out the podcast The Monday Lorians, where we're currently reviewing weekly The Bad Batch. So check that out. I'm doing that with Dave and our other friend Niall. And as for this show, whether you use Anchor, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, Google, whatever you use, subscribe on there, follow us. And if you're on Apple, leave us a rating and a review as it all helps us go up in the ranking. So... Thank you for listening from myself, from Tom, from Rob, and from all these supervillains monologuing. Goodbye now. Farewell, fools! Brought to you by Doombar. <laughs>